Today is August 3rd, 1984. This is Joe Todd, an interview with Dr. Charles Pinoy, P-E-N-O-I. Dr. Pinoy, where were you born? I was born in Anarcho. In Anarcho. Yeah, that was, uh, Oklahoma was the territory in 1907. Mm -hmm. I was born in 1911, September 23rd, 1911. My mother and father we were married in 1903. Uh, I think it was Indian Territory, I'm not sure, but it was uh, east of town there. Of course, my dad went to Carlisle. That's in Pennsylvania. And then when he graduated, well, he stayed there for a year. And he came on to Riverside. There's an agency there called Kiowa Agency. It's not there anymore. Okay, my mother graduated in Cherokee Female Seminary in uh, Tahlequah. Okay, what was your father's name? His name was Mark in New York. I got in genealogy here. I want to give you. Okay, good. And so the whole Reese family. So my mother was a Reese. Mm -hmm. And what was her name? Reese. What was her first name? My mother's name was Eloise. Eloise. <clears throat> and it's all in here. I don't understand the business of the numbers on genealogy. My wife and my niece, they do because they're into genealogy. When did your mother go to the female seminary? When? Yeah. Well, I imagine she'd been in Riverside about a year before she was married. That was 1903. So it was probably a year before that. She went to Cherokee Female Seminary. And when did your father go to, to uh, Carlisle? Probably about the same time, because he came out about the same time. He just ordered my mother. We were talking about that this morning. And on a genealogy. She was born in 1876. My mother was born in 1880. She went over there was born. They didn't have any birth certificates. Mm -hmm. Where was your father born? He was born in Laguna. Laguna. In Casablanca is a village. C A S A B L A N C A. Casablanca, White House. Mm -hmm. Okay, now he's uh, he's Pueblo? Oh, yeah, Pueblo. Mm -hmm. Um, now was the Pueblo, was that a tribe or is it a tribe? No, the tribes? Pueblo is the entire, the entire tribe. Okay. And in any culture you have subcultures. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the Pueblos, they have about 15 or 16 different Pueblos. And they're represented by villages. Because the Pueblos have always been village people. They were not like the Plains people who went up and down the countryside. They were there when the Spanish came up looking for the gold. If you remember Acoma? It's just down south of Laguna. And they were up on the hill for their own protection. They were kind of disappointed. And you remember death comes to Archbishop by Will Cather? That's the story about Acoma, when they threw the old priest off the mm -hmm. top. <laughs> right. Interesting. Okay. Um, did your father ever talk about stories when he was a child at the at Laguna. Yes he did. I have some he was a great writer like myself. We never had really anything published. And I have some of them that I said when I get time I want to get around to uh, publish them and I just give them to my you know my brothers and sisters mm -hmm. and their children and so forth. What are some of the stories they used to tell you about Laguna? Well most of them have you know the Indian culture real well they have stories that the way that they don't whip your kids like white people. They don't abuse them like that, but they have ways of making them behave. All right. So they tell them ghost stories. Very often, like in the Shine Rapo, they always have the little green woman, and they're all almost all the Indians are afraid of owls. I mean, death. If you hear a screech owl, someone's going to die. That's bad luck. <laughs> and uh, they use the methodology of uh, of ghosts. They use the methodology of uh, bad years because Laguna is a desert. That's desert country out there. Mm -hmm. And every house there had a little storage room. They could, didn't eat you, you know. If you have a bad year, well, they had enough to carry them over with grain and maize and all that kind of stuff and uh, and lamb and uh, they would dry that lamb and so forth. And uh, you've heard of lamb stew. Well, most people, mutton is kind of uh, the Navajos are crazy about mutton, but yeah, it's kind of rare. <laughs> if you've ever eaten it, it's, it's not the most delicious in the world, but lamb is. Yeah. 
It's very, it's, it's a choice piece. And so when they were at the sheep camp, they used to say they used to kill a lamb and they would roast it over the charcoal, you know. They were very delicious. And I, as a little kid, I used to go with them out there. And uh, their main food was, uh, at that time, was sheep. And how many cows? Because sheep were easy to herd. And I guess they didn't eat as much. And that had been part of their culture. Where they came from, I don't know. Probably the Navajos, or maybe the Spanish, I'm not sure. I know the dogs came from the Spanish. There was no dogs in America until the Spanish came. I um, had the good fortune to also study anthropology in the University of New Mexico. And you learned about ethnic groups of peoples and their cultures and so forth. Any stories that have been handed down through Laguna about the Spanish coming through? Not that I remember. Mm -hmm. I remember him telling about the Spanish coming through there. Um, we had it mostly historical. There was a Pueblo Revolution, they called it. It was more up around Santa Fe. And there was quite a revolution. They tried to run all the Spanish and the whites off. That was in 16... Mm, don't know, a long time ago. If I'm not mistaken, that was in 1619? Probably in the 1600s sometime, yeah. That's when they captured a lot of the horses from the Spanish. Very likely. Yeah, because uh, when I was in uh, Anthropology University of Oklahoma, yeah. studying under Dr. Pales, mm -hmm. near Southwest, and I think it was... Yeah, most of those were captured the uh, horse, captured from the Spanish. Dog came with the Spanish. Mm -hmm. I don't know about beef cattle, and I don't know about sheep, but I suspect it came from the Spanish also, because... Still, the Navajo old-timers are um, oriented to sheep. That's their substance food. Yeah. You can't have to live on nothing, you know. And when my dad was growing up, they had a lot of sheep. Now, they don't have a lot of sheep now. Uh, they have uh, gone into beef cattle. And I wrote a book, it's called No More Buffaloes. Well, what happened when the Lagunas got uranium? The culture changed. They had a lot of wealth and they could earn a lot of money working in the mines. Mm -hmm. And so what was used to going out and herding sheep when they could make a lot of money? Uh, there's always been this back and forth. Well, one day the arena was going to play out, then what? And it has already begun to play out. And a lot of people don't understand that, and the uh, old timers tried to tell them that, but you know, you don't listen to your elders too much. Right. You think you're smarter than they are. <laughs> Is sheep then would be the staple food yeah, it was at that time. When my dad was growing up, it was a staple food. And they all had irrigation, you know. They were just like the Egyptians. They had irrigations all over that place. Mm -hmm. And still today, I have to pay irrigation dues, $15 a year. There's no irrigation, but that goes to the village to keep it up. And they still have a dividend. Lagunas do. Not the rest, not all the Pueblo, just the Lagunas, because they're the ones who had uranium. They get a dividend from their investment of about $700 a year. Each member, now to get on the travel roll in Laguna Pueblo, you have to be one half. And it doesn't make any difference if you're a quarter Laguna and three four some other tribes still can't get on it. You gotta be one half Laguna. So you're half? Oh yeah, I'm half. My dad was full blood, you see. Mm -hmm. And my two boys got on. Before they got the rules got so stringent, they not, because there's a water down again because my wife is not in it at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were about a quarter. But they're on. Uh, what kind of crops did they raise? Most of the goes corn because they could wish down there. And keep in mind they had uh, irrigation. Mm -hmm. And they had a lot of fruit at that time. Mm -hmm. And most of the fruit trees are gone now. If you go out there, you can see some old peach tree that's about gone because they haven't really taken care of it. They haven't irrigated it anymore. See, the water comes from up around Parahi. It's, there's a lake up there, and then they have uh, a lot of wells now that they have drilled, so they, they have running water in those villages, but they don't uh, irrigate anymore. They've lost that uh, technique through the change in culture. So they eat just about everything everybody else eats, except they're delicious. They like that Indian bread, and it's not fried bread. It's baked in those ovens, and the crust is hard. Yeah. And it doesn't mold like uh, if you buy it down a brace a couple of days, it's, it's moldy. 
it'll keep a long period of time. It's delicious, and they used to dunk it in the stew, you know, and, and make it delicious food. How do they make that bread? What's it made of? Mostly just flour and uh, some of them make it rice, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I don't they may have yeast of some kind, but you know, you can make sour bread. What do you call that? Sourdough. Sourdough bread, and uh, they may have had that. Mm -hmm. Those loaves are not big, they're just about this big. Yeah. But they will keep forever. And they're baking those big ovens. That's right. And if you go to Albuquerque today, go down to the Culture Center, which I was treated on, they still sell that bread for a dollar and a quarter loaf. Because an awful lot of people like it. It's very tasty. It's not like uh, what the Indians call white bread. And that's the kind that comes out of bakeries here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> or sometimes they call it light bread. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they call it white bread. It didn't make any difference. But it's the same thing. But it keeps a long time. And it had to because uh, I thought there was no refrigeration, mm -hmm. no ice boxes or nothing. Okay. Now, your mother, did she ever tell stories about the female seminary? Not a great deal. We had a lot of pictures, and you saw some of them, but a lot of them have been distributed to the other members of the family. She had some real good friends, um, Maggie Drew, who was a classmate of hers, who also went to Riverside. And when I was over last year, I went to the female seminar where they had those big columns, you know, uh, still standing. Mm -hmm. But the Cherokees, as you well know, at that period, were well-educated people, for the most part. They had their own schools. Yeah. Well, they built that seminary, what, in the 1850s? I don't know. It the burned way. all the way down. Yeah, those three columns burned in 88, and they built the new one in 89. The one that's uh, northeastern now. Northeastern now. Yeah. Is that the one your mother attended? It's, I think she went to the. I'm not sure. I don't yeah. remember. Okay. I really don't remember. She didn't say anything about it. How did your mother and your father meet? Cherokee well, and. She came from a uh, different culture. She worked at Riverside Indian School. Mm -hmm. And my dad worked at Kiowa Agency. And if you know Anadarko real well, it's only about a mile and a half apart. And in those days, it was a horse and buggy day because there was no cars. And they had a lot of socials, you know, um, and picnics and a lot of things that when they had a chance to meet. And they met there. And when they married at uh, East of Town, Dr. Fate, F-A-I-T, who was a Presbyterian minister. They were married. They went in a horse and buggy. I heard them tell that, and I forget who went with them. They, they remembered, but I don't remember now. Mm -hmm. Um, what was your father doing at the college agency? Being he was, um, of course, he took bookkeeping while he was at Carlisle. So he did uh, an awful lot of the books. And at that time, they didn't have computers and they didn't have all the fancy things. They had these great big ledgers. And all the men, all these little bills, on the, and there were black things on there to keep their shirts from getting dirty. And my dad is not like me, he had a beautiful hand. I mean, he would write beautiful. Everything he wrote, it was just a masterpiece. You could read it, you could read it. Now, you can't read mine. My secretary can read it, but that's about all. And he was a bookkeeper, essentially. And they did a lot of leasing. As the country began to change, well, they're trying to make farmers out of those people, but the Plains Indians were never farmers. They were used to, uh, Dancing, they used to power on, they used to have a lot of other things, and they would have a beef while they would have a good time. Mm -hmm. so, so they began to rent it because they needed money. They began to lease it. Mm -hmm. And he was probably a lease clerk, I'm not sure what his title was, but uh, it was a pretty good sized agency. You may have seen pictures of the Kyle agency before they turned it down. It was so big. he was just working as a clerk from Carlisle then? Yeah, mm -hmm. he was working as a clerk there. Mm -hmm. And he worked there all his life until uh, he retired. Of course, when you mention Carlisle, I guess everybody mentions Jim Thorpe. Oh, yeah. Now, did your father go there before Jim Thorpe went there? I have some pictures at home of those football players. And Pop Warner is the one he always talks about. Mm -hmm. I, Jim Thorpe was probably a younger, much younger man than my dad. Because he went there in 1911, 1910? Yeah, and when he went, he couldn't even speak English. Mm -hmm. And they took a chaperone from Laguna, and they took, oh, enough to make a class, boys and girls. 
And I heard them say they went from Laguna to Albuquerque, which is about 50 miles in a, in a bug, horse and wagon, you know. And then they met the uh, somebody, superintendent, they said, and they got on the train and we went to Carlisle. Now, Carlisle is out of Harrisonburg, Pennsylvania, if you've been up there. And he spent, he never really come home during the summertime because he'd work out. They what they call outing, and he'd work in Maine, and they worked in Harrisburg, and he worked for a bunch of Quakers. And he had a lot of Quaker ways about him, the food that he ate and he liked. Mm-hmm. And as long as he lived, and as long as those people were up there, <clears throat> they used to exchange Christmas gifts uh, until that family died, and my dad died, and of course it just petered out, next generation. Mm-hmm. But he, they all wore uniforms. And uh, he had a blue uniform with a stripe. I guess he was a sergeant. And I had it a long time, and then I got careless with it, and let moth got in the thing and destroyed it. I kicked myself with that, but uh, those things are gone. Mm-hmm. I still got my World War II uniform. You did? Yeah, I keep it uh, in a hanger with uh, mothballs, and I can still wear it. <laughs> what was. What did your father study at Carlisle? Mostly bookkeeping. Bookkeeping. But you see, first, he didn't understand English. None of them did. They just took him right off the reservation up there. And those teachers, for the most part, had to teach them how to speak English. <clears throat> but he was, he could speak Pueblo well. and knew all the songs and everything. And he, he was very good bilingual. I mean, he never had any trouble with English language because he did have a good education. Actually, he graduated from the 12th grade up there. He stayed a year and took more bookkeeping and more accounting, or whatever they called it then, <clears throat> before he came out here. Mm-hmm. So when he came down to Anadarko, was he a federal employee? Well, at that time, it was, uh, if you remember, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. <clears throat> well, the Quakers were there first. Mm-hmm. And they decided that uh, they should get out of the business. At <clears throat> first, the... Uh, Used to be a Quaker superintendent. You read that history. And in the office was in Lawrence, Kansas. You think that's how he got the job at the agency? Well, with the Quakers? Yeah. They wanted they were taking students because they were well educated. All those men and women who graduated from there were, were well educated in terms of reading and writing. And of course he had bookkeeping knowledge. <clears throat> so he, he went right direct from school to the to Ronald Arfo. Uh, there wasn't, I don't know if they met him at Chickasha. For a long time there wasn't many trains there, you know. Passenger trains, I really don't know what he never did say. I never did ask him. What year did he start working at the agency? Well, I don't know. You'd have to uh, take his birthday, which was... Uh, 1876? Yeah, and add 12 by 13 years to that. Mm-hmm. And that would probably be a good index as to when he... So around 1890, yeah. something like that. Yeah, he's young man. Okay. Yeah. He had a lot of pictures of Carlisle. I wish I got a few. I'm to fade, though. I'll give you some of them, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, you were born in Anadarko? Mm-hmm. At the Kiowa Agency. At the Kiowa Agency. There was no Anadarko there at that time. When was Anadarko founded? Yeah, I don't know. Tell me some stories about your childhood. Well, I was, uh, as I say, I was born at the Kiowa Agency. And Kiowa Agency was a government installation. And all the employees, that, they all had houses. It was like kind of like a fort. They all had houses and uh, something like a fort because the superintendent had the biggest house, you know. And the uh, assistant superintendent had the next biggest house. And they all had a government doctor. And uh, the government doctor had the next best house. And then, according to rank, I guess, and the, how you stood with the superintendent, all that, that was a pretty big place. Then they had a club, we call it the clubhouse. It was a, about a two story building over there by the jail uh, in which the single people stayed. You know, there were single clerks, and they came in from everywhere to go to work there. And they didn't have a jail there on the other side of the, uh, I think maybe it's still standing there. It's made out of that red rock, that red brick you see around there. Mm-hmm. 
And we used to go around and hear a lot of stories about who was in there mostly. I think those stories, but I never really seen anybody locked up in there. Mm. <laughs> and there was a log cabin next to the old cowboy agency for a long, long time. And it was one of the original buildings. And they used it for office space also. Uh, yeah, there was very many happy memories because there were a lot of children uh, at the Cowboy Agency. And a lot of the people at the agency at Anadarko called it Old Town. We never called it Old Town. It was always Cowboy Agency because mm -hmm. that's what it was. Uh, when was it established, the agency? Sure. When was the agency established? I don't know. I just don't know. And you said the Quakers wanted to get out of the agency, and when yeah. did they back out and let? Well, I have written this history of Riverside. I was looking at it the other day. I'd be glad to send it to you, but I don't know. I don't, hate to give you a wrong date. Mm -hmm. well, I, I just don't know. But it was pretty early because, you see, there were no cars. Everybody had horse and wagon, or they had buggies, or you walked. And we all went to public school there in, in Anadarko. And I, it's a funny thing because my mother was a teacher. <laughs> And I walked to uh, Anadark with the rest of the kids in the first grade. And uh, I didn't, they didn't tell me much about the school. And when recess came around, I thought it was all over. I went on home. <laughs> they all laughed about that. <laughs> some, some educator, you went home for it. And I didn't know, though, my mother brought me back. <laughs> I still remember my first grade teacher. Now, it's funny, a lot of the teachers you don't remember, you know. But Sally Carter, she was my first grade teacher, and she was a very warm woman. And they had lovely little songs that if you were late, they would sing songs and point your finger at you, you know, that you were late. I got a great big old clock. I learned to tell time in the first grade. Now, some of the kids I work with these days, they don't learn to tell time until maybe in the fourth or fifth grade, and then not too well. But I learned in the first grade. At that time, they also used flashcards, and they still use flashcards. You see, they learned word reading. You learned by certain words, and they would hold up cards, and, and you would identify them, and so forth. But uh, yeah, those were good times. Mm -hmm. and of course, my sisters and brothers went to school at the same time. Everybody went to school, carried their lunch. There was no such thing as a cafeteria or going uptown. You carried your lunch. And after I went into the Seventh or eighth grade, <clears throat> up there, the uh, they had a kind of a cloakroom, you know, where you put your lunch pail or your bucket or whatever you took there. You weren't very careful; somebody who forgot their lunch pail would take yours and eat it. You know, it was a very interesting thing. Also, I don't know if you still do or not, but they had big Valentine Day. Everyone had Valentine's, and you draw names, and of course your sweetheart, you'd uh, secretly give her a Valentine. You know, right. <laughs> it was real funny. That was the time of bootleggers, you know, mm -hmm. 7th and 8th and all that, 7th and 8th grade. And one of the uh, richest guys in town who had only Cadillac in town, he, well, his girlfriend kind of liked me. I mean, his girl kind of liked me. And she used to bring me candy and all kind of things. And uh, I forgot what that girl's name was. Dunn, I think. But she was always bringing me something, you know, candy and so forth. And she sat real close to me. At that time, you don't know this girl's too much, you know, you know they're around, but uh, mm -hmm. girls just grow up a lot faster than you do. And parties, uh, they didn't have that. But I remember they used to have those maypoles. And I remember the, the, the maypoles were a big thing. They would go down a courthouse lawn, every class, I mean, every class had to get out there and practice the maypole, and it was a big thing. And I kind of embarrassed my mother one time. They were all supposed to wear white shirts. I didn't tell my mother that. I should have. And when she came to watch me, I had a blue shirt on. I was the only one with a blue shirt. <laughs> she liked to die. Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> I said, well, I just forgot all about it. It didn't make that much difference. They wear a blue shirt or a white shirt. You know. But that was really something. But those were good times because, uh, and as we grew up, the uh, people who had, like the superintendent and the doctor, the doctor had their first car. And if he wanted to really be good to us, <laughs> You were letting him ride town in that old car, you know. What kind of car was it? Oh, I don't know. Oh, Buick or something, because they had Buicks for a long, long time. What but was it was a touring, you know, a touring car. What was your reaction when you first saw the car, first time? 
I didn't have a special reaction. I just thought they'd be a nice to have, you know, say you're on a walk and so forth. And they were not great cars. I mean, they were just a little faster transportation. And we were used to walking. Uh, it was great. Mm -hmm. And one of the doctors had a very nice uh, daughter. I was kind of interested in that time. What her name was? A little blonde, little, little old gal. It was really nice looking. And she kind of liked me. She used to ask me to ride in her dad's car. That was a nice thing. <laughs> To go ride in that car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I was telling Darla the other day when I reached the eighth grade, at that time all the boards were knickers. I don't know if you remember knickers or not. Like plus boards that uh, golfers used to wear. Right. I would wear overalls, striped overalls. That's what all the boards were in a blue shirt. And that was a acceptable pattern. Well, when we got into ninth grade, we all began to wear long trousers. That was a significance. Then you were in ninth grade then. You know, no longer one of the uh, young students. But I was always interested in sports, always have been. And when I think about it, um, as an organizer and uh, putting things together, I was always organizing track meets and baseball tournaments and things like that on Saturdays, you know. Always doing that kind of thing. And of course, we live close to the Washington River. It was down west of that's between the Kiowa Agency and Riverside. And little river would come up every year. I would go down there and um, it was a wonderful place to dig caves. They were soft, you know. We'd take potatoes down there and build a fire, make an oven and uh, make those potatoes and those things and then eat them. I thought that was the greatest thing ever left. <laughs> it was kind of funny. There was a place called a sand dipper down there because they used sand, of course, and mortar. And that riverbed had a lot of coarse grain sand in it and the old sand dipper and his son used to go down in a wagon and go down there and then they'd dip it out in a great big old scoop and it had a kind of a bridge that would run down there and this thing would run down there and they'd dump it off and then they'd pull it back up. And they liked to drop, drink chalk beer. And the young man who was a, uh, I don't know how old he was, he took his girlfriend down there. <clears throat> and they were more interested in each other in the chalk beer than they were in the <laughs> I remember one time, they were out there on top of that sand, they were really going after each other. And we thought it was funny, we didn't really know what was going on. And we began to chunk them with rocks and mud. <laughs> they would come running after us, <laughs> stark naked, you know, ain't no. <laughs> and it was real funny that um, you never thought much about bodies at that time. It's, I don't think they were aware of it because the boys and the girls, if they wanted to swim, they would swim together. But usually it would up the creek a little. Mm -hmm. But we never wore a swimsuit. Cut off or nothing. I was just all of, and there were a lot of blacks in the dark one. We used to get along with them real well. We'd swim together sometimes and we'd choose up and have mud fights at each other. Mm -hmm. uh, there was none of that hostility that you see now. Um how come the blacks moved in the area? When did they first well, come in? they were on what they call the northbound or north side of town, Anadarko, and that was between the agency and town. Mm -hmm. And of course, they liked to swim like everybody else, and so they used to come down there and swim, and there was no animosity between the two. It was kind of a funny thing. Upstream, there was before swimming pools and everything, they got they built bathhouses. And the society people used to go down there and they had their own bathhouse. And I won't walk down into the river, you know. I don't watch it all. You see it's muddy and most of the time and it's red most of the time. And it goes up and down depending upon the rain. But that was it. I mean, they would go down there in horse and buggies and on Sunday and parade around in those those garments they used to call swimsuits, they were not much made for swimming. They were big old things. <laughs> oh, yeah, swimming, those things. They'd pull you down, you know. <laughs> Real funny. But, but Riverside and, and the agency, they had a lot of social events together. Mm -hmm. And I used to play, uh, I was good in sports, and I played tennis. And they had their own tennis courts, and uh, <laughs> they would only let me play when they didn't have a partner. And when I'd beat them, it'd really make them mad. And they didn't like that at all. They didn't like to play with me. <laughs> but uh, I just had to take catch as catch can and play when I could. Who was superintendent when you were? Well, John A. Button always comes to my mind. John A. Uh, he was a very good friend of my dad's, my mother's, 
and uh, he was there for a long time. He was, was also. He, was he white? Was he not yeah. Indian? They didn't have Indian superintendents at that time. Why not? I guess they just didn't, I don't know why. The Department of Interior probably thought they were not smart enough. Mm -hmm. hmm. You mentioned your mother talking about her grandparents and the slaves. Well, not their slaves. They had slaves. Oh, okay. They had slaves. No, they weren't slaves. I mean, but the grandparents who had slaves. Yeah, all the Cherokees had slaves who okay. were in the money, in the chips. It was just, it was just like property. It was just like land. It was like a southern, you've read a lot of southern history. Well, they in society. Because over there, I tell you, it's the funny thing about Cherokee country over there. If you're not part Cherokee, you're not anything. I mean, that's really true. And those old people, and particularly if you come from an old family, if you can trace your old family back, then you're somebody. I'm going to tell you, it's really interesting. Those people are really very conscious of uh, social strata, not England, like England, but it's, it's, uh, it's that way. Where did uh, she come from, your grandmother? Well, uh, ultimately, you know, they all came from Georgia in one time or other. And I was looking into this thing, and I'll give you a copy because I have an extra copy of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it tells all about the Reese family. Yeah, what was her name, your grandmother's name? I'm sorry? What was your grandmother's name? Well, Susanna Reese, there it is at the top. Okay, that's Susanna the, that's Reese. the original. Mm -hmm. uh, you can look at it if you want to yeah. and uh, carry it on down. I don't remember my grandmother too much. She came into the Kyle Agency one time and she died there. Uh, I don't remember, just very big to remember. That she was there and that she died and my mad mother was real sad. But children, you know, they don't remember sadness too much. Mm -hmm. Did she ever talk about coming to Indian Territory? The my grandmother? grandmother? Yeah. As I say, I don't even, just barely remember her mm -hmm. being in the house. And I remember my Uncle Charles, I was in time, Uncle Charles, he used to come there frequently. And my grandfather, I don't even remember seeing him, but I remember going over there several times with my mother to visit. She lives around Fort Gibson. Fort Gibson, they had, that's where the home place is. She always called it the home place. I guess it was her father and mother's place. Mm -hmm. And uh, above there was a cemetery. She always talked about the home place. And, you know, some of those people they had outlaws around there at that time. It was a pretty rugged country. And they used to, my sister, older sister, you know, I see, I'm 72, my brother's 74. My other sister's 76. She was about 78 or somewhere along there. She had remembered when they used to set food out, you know, just, and it would be gone. And the people would come off. Some of those, uh, I don't suppose you call them outlaws, but they were fugitives from the law, and they would come pick it up. <laughs> and they fed them. And that's why they liked to go. Of course, those Indian families would never tell on them, you know. The law could never find them. Mm -hmm. That's a good place to go. And if you remember some early Oklahoma history, that's where some of those people used to go to Crookton Hills. Right. The, the Reese family, were they some that came over before the removal, or did they come over the, during the trail? I couldn't tell you that. I really don't know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I'm sure they did. Mm -hmm. Sometime we go up to the uh, Historical Society, that's where you work. Go up on the third floor. There's a great big uh, painting. Trail of Tears. Yeah, right. Okay. It was painted by Elizabeth Jans, J A N E S. Mm -hmm. And the guy carrying that dagger, that's me. Mm -hmm. I posed for that when she was down at the University of Oklahoma. Okay. And instead of being a sack, it was a rope. She just put a rope over there and had to stand there. And she was a graduate student. And she painted that as a project for her, her graduate. Uh, program, I suppose, mm -hmm. in art. Elizabeth Jan. Um, um, where did she get her the idea for the for the painting? How did she? I don't know. She was an OU at the time. And I think she was from the eastern part of the state. Yeah. When was that? When did she paint that picture? Well, I first went to OU in the 34, 35, 36. Somewhere along in there. Mm -hmm. Do you remember World War One? 
Oh yeah, I do, because I was at the Kiowa Agency. And you remember that's when they began to first have airplanes. Okay? And those old biplanes would fly over with Fort Shell. We'd all run out to sit. Airplane, airplane, this airplane, first one to sit. <laughs> first one to sit. That was a great thing, you know. But go down to Fort Shell. I never did go down to Fort Shell, but uh, yeah, I remember lower and those old songs. Pick up your troubles in your old kid bag and uh, smile and all those old tunes. Mm -hmm. I can remember that, yeah. Was there any effort, work for the war effort at the Kiowa Agency during that war? I'm sure there was. Most every place is very patriotic. And Indians, as you know, are very patriotic people. And they fall behind wars and fascists than they do with any other thing. Because in the Plains Indians, they have this uh, war mother society. And the war song was one of the first songs that they sang when they began to powwow, you know. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that they were, although they were not aware, and a lot of them went to World War One. a lot of the Indians were, went in, they volunteered, most of them were not drafted, they just went in, and they thought we were good to go in. <coughs> Do you know any of the songs your father used to sing? Pueblo songs are very difficult to remember, and I used to think I did. I've got record, but they're not very clear. My sister has a record it. You see, they didn't have tapes those times. And it was put on kind of a steel laminated plate of some kind, and it got scratched. And my sister said, if you come over sometime, I'll uh, get you tape it. I said, okay. I used to think their tempo is different than the Plains Indian music. And if you watch, have you watched Pueblo dances? No. They don't round dance. They don't have Stray dances, they don't have all this kind of like planes in these. They dance in rows, like fish, you know. Mm -hmm. And they have their garbs a lot different than the buffalo dance. And the men and the women, the women always have a piece of cedar. And they, boy, I used to listen to my dad, he had a little drum there, and he used to play that drum and sing those songs. And I said, now I got it. I never did get the temple because you got to know the music, of course. Mm -hmm. And I never did, but you can, if you're in Pueblo land, and you can buy those tapes now and if you go to Albuquerque, um, they sell them. But the temple is so much different than the Shiner up on that music. Mm -hmm. I would recognize it. Yeah. I never learned them, no. I never learned Pueblo, except just a few words like Narista, which means uncle. Uh, that's about it. The Pueblos, do they have... Um nuclear family, extended family, or how's the family? Oh my, yes. Still are. You see, they live in villages. Mm -hmm. They have clans. I belong to Eagle Clan. It's like belong to a society. You're born into it. And they're all your kinfolks. Really. But they're not. They call what they call Indian style. Indian style means that uh, your sister, but she's not really your sister, except she might be her husband might be a clan member, mm -hmm. and so they identify, but they have also very strict rules against marriage within clans. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, they know that you're not supposed to marriage within your own clan, you're supposed to marry without your own clan. But now you can bring your wife home, that's all right. But marriage, it's like marrying your sister, you see, right. and they don't, don't go along with that. Are they matrilineal or patrilineal? I'm sorry? Are they matrilineal or patrilineal? It's much like um, the society in, uh, in the U.S. today. Most of the men think they rule the roost, but they don't, their wives do. Yeah. And it's the same way out there. The women always had the money. Uh, and the men would go around like a bunch of roosters, flapping their wings, and making a lot of noise, and being the boss. But they were really not the boss, it was the woman who. But they the, were not like the Navajos. Now, yeah. the Navajos, owned, the woman owned all the property. Mm -hmm. And she got a divorce, she just throw the his stuff all out, and it was all over. Well, they all had, see that, that's a reservation of land, if you build a house, it was your father's house. And it was his, as long as, and they were determinate, you see. Uh, mm -hmm. You couldn't sell a land, you still can't sell a land, you could sell a house. But generally, as long as you paid your $15 a month, that's, that was yours. Mm -hmm. And your children should use it, and their children should use it, and still pretty much that way. 
that's a close knit family society. I mean, it's really as close as in Plains Indian. My goodness, sakes alive! It when was, the the man, man and woman were married, did they go live with his family or her family? Generally, the wife went with his family. It, not always, but that's the way it did. Mm -hmm. Lots of times, just like young people today, they want their own place, and maybe they build another room onto it. Which wasn't too difficult. You just adobe, you know, put the bricks on there and you got another room. So if you go into the old homes out there, not the new ones, you'll find out where another room has been built, another room has been built, and since you got running water and toilets, <laughs> you can build another room for the running water and the bathtub and the toilets. Because when I first went out there, they all had outhouses. They didn't have toilets. And sanitation was good, but um, running water, no, they didn't have running water. Mm -hmm. So how large would the family be? How the extended family? We're about like five, uh, five children and their grandmother and grandfather and then on because if you know Pueblo they live a long time. Yeah. Would it be like aunts and uncles and cousins? Oh my goodness, yes, all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad used to keep that, he had it straight and I depended upon him and he would always visit, visit all the villages that he had relatives. And he'd take me along with my brother. <clears throat> They had a custom now, it isn't so prevalent now, it's where every time you go to a family you had to eat. I remember my dad saying, now when you go here we're going to be going to a lot of places to, and they're going to bring out the food and you have to eat. But he said, don't eat much. Just be polite and eat a little because, and don't put a lot on your plate, don't waste it. Because every place we go now they're going to feed you. Mm -hmm. And they did. <laughs> At that time also, they used to give you gifts. They would give you gifts mm -hmm. because we didn't go out there frequently about once a year or something like that. Although about towards the last, my dad would go out there and had to retire and spend the summer with some of his relatives. And he did that as long as he could until he was unable to go out there. Mm -hmm. What would be, I guess, in the white society, our big holiday would be Christmas, Fourth of July. In the Pueblo, what were the big holidays? Well, they had to, if you know, that's. Spanish influencers, they had Saints Days, you know, and Saints Days, and if your birthday fell on um, Saints Day, you had to give uh, what they call a giveaway, and you'd get on top of the house, and they all knew around the village what time it was going to be and what house to go to, so the people who, for example, my was going to have to give things away, so you get on top of the house and throw away bread and soda pop and biscuits or whatever you want to give, you know, blankets and so forth, and they used to take me along because I was tall. And most pueblos are short. <laughs> I reach up and <laughs> grab that stuff, you know. <laughs> they like to have me along. <laughs> they used to laugh about that. And a lot of humor, and uh, those people, uh, the um, different humor than they have among the uh, Caucasian society, but it, they had a lot of humor. Mm -hmm. What would you give away? I'd give away the same thing to you because some of my relatives would give me things to give, you know. Yeah. Uh, or you could always buy bread. You could give away anything you wanted to. It really didn't, it wasn't a matter of just the matter that you did. Now, of course, since uh, Christian influence, which is mostly Spanish and Catholic, they recognized Christmas like everybody else in the years and a half for a long, long time. But the, the Saints' days were the big days in my estimation, and then they were fiestas. They don't call them powwows. Some of them do. But there were fiestas, and they come Spanish again. Um, they had several kinds. They had the kind that was open to the public, and then they had the closed fiesta, which was just for the pueblo, and no outsiders were admitted. What was the difference? What would well, it would be what they call a religious ceremony. And since I don't speak the language, I don't know that much. But what just my dad would tell me, you know, what, what it was all about. And I have a very close. To, He's really nice. He's on my same clan, and he's very talkative, and he'll tell me anything. Now, most of them won't, because they kind of consider me an outsider, because they don't really live there. Mm -hmm. Might as well go back and identify with them. And they just really don't know how to accept me. Although there's a few pueblos around, there's one in Oklahoma City called, I think she's there, Millie Gago, who is a, was a pueblo. But basically, they have never left their villages. There's a little, they worked for that railroad, and uh, they were lined up in Arizona at that uh, railhead up there. Can't think of the name of it. 
But basically, I stayed pretty close to home. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the Depression, 1930s. Oh, boy. How'd that affect It was interesting, because when my father retired from the government, he lost his eyesight, and he lost his health, pretty much. And my mother and I, I had finished high school in 1929, Anadarko Public School. And it really hadn't hit, and 29 was a good year. I mean, we had good times, and the cotton was going. I had five cotton gins in Anadarko, and they were just going day and night. Mm -hmm. And then the Dust Bowl, as you remember, came about the same time. Okay, those two things happened. My mother and I were in business. We were running a cafe to make a living. And they closed all the banks. I mean, it was, nobody had any money. Now, there was one thing that saved us. When my dad had a little pension coming from the government since he retired, and out of that small pension he got, I used to take five dollars every month and take it down to the post office. At that time, they had postal savings. Do you remember that? Postal savings. Yeah, they had postal okay. savings. And all post office, they don't have it anymore. Mm -hmm. And every month, I would take five dollars down there and take out postal savings. Now then, when that thing hit and all the banks were closed. That was the only place that you could get cash. And I hadn't told my dad or my mother that I had been doing that. And they were just worried how we were going to pay our rent, how we were going to do this and that. And I said, well, I think I know. How? Well, I told them about the postal savings. Well, it was incredible. That's what saved us. Mm -hmm. well, it wasn't a great deal of money because uh, in those days, if you had cash money, man, you had a lot because you could buy bread for a nickel, milk for a dime, beef steak, I don't know probably two bits a pound. Um, but it was real funny about the Depression. It hit everybody the way, same way. And nobody felt scared. Nobody run. Nobody got to breaking in stores. Nobody. I think today they would. I think they'd probably go crazy. Yeah. Because they're not used to design themselves. And right. if I grew up in the economy of you got to it's kind of a, you don't have a lot, you got to take care of what you got, you know. We, we had plenty of food, we never missed a meal, and we had milk cows and buggies and big gardens and all that, but we never um, wasted anything, we worked hard. Did the restaurant close? And finally, I went back, to, I went to school at OU, and my mother couldn't manage it any longer, so she sold it, mm -hmm. which was probably a good thing. Tell me about the dust storms. How bad were they? They were bad, even in the dark, they would come in and just, just black in the sky or red in the sky, you couldn't hardly see and you couldn't hardly breathe. They would just come in there and it was, uh, it was incredible. But again, the people didn't get frightened. They just accepted that and that was just the way it was and they would just do what they could. And they had a little humor. There was an old guy across the street from me. He was uh, <laughs> ran a furniture store and his name was Mr. Yates. I went over one time, they had a lot of baby buggers and baby beds. I said, How do you, why do you carry so many of those, Mr. Yates? Let me tell you something. He said, that's one crop that never fails. He said, kids, they always be here every year. I said, well, that's, that's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what time is your appointment with Dr. Uh, Lowry? Oh, tell me about World War II. World War II. I was, in Santa, I was working in Fort Wingate at the time. I had belonged to the National Guard, as I told you. And when you get out of the guard, you have to leave the state. You have to uh, resign from the guard, and I did. And I was working as a teacher at Fort Wingate. And that's just kind of a sparse country. That's close to Gallup, you know. There was not many young men. And I didn't think too much about it. And, and they drafted me. I got a call from the president and said, you have to go into the Army. So I said, well, I'll be done. I was married, too. I didn't have children. And I was a little bit older than most of those people. I did not start to school early because after the big depression I had to wait a while to get enough money to get even ten dollars to go to school. And um, so I went to Santa Fe for a physical mm -hmm. and a lot of them didn't pass. So um, the guys who passed, they put them in one hotel and the other guys rejected, they put them in another little hotel. We got on the train, we didn't know where we were going, so we went to Fort Sill. This is a funny thing now. When we got to Fort Sill, the trucks came and picked us up. And they dumped us off to different company areas, you know, 45th. At that time, it was a square division, okay, and they had quartermaster there. <clears throat> and I had belonged to the Better B 150th 
8th Field Artillery in Anadarkle. I'd also had belonged to the Quartermaster Corps, uh, both of them, and I had belonged to Quartermaster Corps last, so when <laughs> they dropped me off, they dropped me off of my old company, Company C or Company B, and the rest of were all recruits, and they well, I'm a darn, those guys couldn't believe it. Here's old Panoy. What you doing in here? I said, well, I'm a raw recruit. And they were supposed to teach us how to make up beds and all those basic things, you know. And they said, oh, you don't need that. I said, yeah, you guys got to teach me how to make up beds. How to do those things. I've been that cigar raisin, that cigar. Ever since they had those old horses, you know, in the cow. They had horses and they had those campaign hats, you know, with the uh, tassels on them, you know, and they had leggings. They didn't have wrap leggings, they had uh, canvas leggings yeah. on the inside. <laughs> they were real funny. So what did you do in the National Guard? Well, mostly nothing. But we used to get those old field pieces out, those 75s at that time. Mm -hmm. And they go through drill, you know, how the station position, you know. Yeah. But since I was raised in a restaurant, they always wanted me to cook. So I went down there and I'd run the mess hall for them. And the old mess sergeant really liked me. and. Uh, he just let me have free time. I didn't have to stand hikes or nothing like that at that time. It was uh, pretty much of a fun thing, really. Did you go overseas? With the National Guard? Yeah. Well, I kept on going. And finally they transferred to 45th Infantry Division down to Camp Barkley. And from there they made it to what they call a triangular division. So they eliminated Quartermaster. Okay, they just had one company, a Quartermaster. It used to be a regiment, I think. And then they transferred that into uh, ordnance. So I ended up in ordnance. And again, down in Camp Barkley, <clears throat> the sergeants and the guys were all from Anadarka, and they knew me. And they said, well, we'll let you run the officer's mess, and you don't have to stand any kind of formations. You just feed the officers, and we'll give you some extra bonuses, and we'll get to the town back and forth. Was it Abilene? I think it was Abilene, Texas, yeah. where that was. And and those salesmen would come out and want to sell us stuff, and they'd come and pick us up in their cars. And, and the rest of those guys, they couldn't get to town on those slow buses, you know. <laughs> it was really kind of funny. Well, really, it was pretty easy there again. But we'd come back to Oklahoma City, which was a long ways in those old cars at that time. Mm -hmm. Then from there, we went to uh, up Watertown, New York. And it was cold up there, man. That's when it was a lot different because I didn't get into any more cooking. I always had to cook them from then on. And um, I began to get into the uh, ordinance part of it, the demolition part of it, and small arms, although I didn't work in small arms pretty much. I got into the demolition because my colonel, I was a uh, kind of right-hand man to him. He was a Dutchman. What was his name? Freegang. Mm -hmm. Richard Freegang. He's dead now. Lives in Denver. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a small unit of us, about five of us together, and we worked in that. <clears throat> he used to take care of us very well. And it was cold up there. We spent the entire year there. No, we went to Fort Devens first, mm -hmm. and then up to Watertown. And then from Watertown, we went down to uh, Blackstone, Virginia. I can't even that camp down there. Maybe you remember it. Oh, I don't remember it anyway. I've it heard was, about it. Um, yeah, it was a camp there. And then we shipped out. At uh, that Navy place down there in uh, Newport News. Newport News. We got on a train, went down to Newport News, and got on an old uh, ship of some kind. LSD? No, it wasn't LSD, it was a ship, it was a big one. Mm -hmm. And that was great because it was June, and there wasn't any storms on the Atlantic. It took us a month to get from Newport News to Africa. And it was beautiful, the weather was just stars and sky and everything, we'd sleep on top of the deck and I boy, this is really something, you know. <laughs> we landed in Casablanca and all those places. Any trouble with uh, the Germans going over the submarines? We were just mostly scared. Uh, you've seen those ships, those troop ships, or bunks, way down there, I mean, different levels, you know. And you got about that much room, that's your bunk, you know, and you can't even turn over. You have to slide out, you know. And you hear that all work. Boy, you know, I need to get up and walk out. I don't want to get out of here. If I'm going to die, I want to die on top. Right. Well, you would have made a difference anyway because Atlantic would probably 
slowly down with the ship. But anyway, you had that kind of thinking. And of course, you had to be very careful about blackouts, you know. You know cigarette smoking lad was almost always out. Uh, it was pleasant going over, except for, and they were in the convoy, you know, with balloons. And it wasn't bad at all. But when we hit Africa, we had to all get off with our A bags and B bags and all of our woolens. We had on woolens. And get out there in the desert. And it was hot. It was really hot. Camp out. We didn't stay out too long. We get back on ship again. And we hit Sicily. We're at Sicily. Where'd you land? No, it wasn't about. The southern, southern part. I remember those places. I went all the way across Sicily and we ended up at Palermo. And Palermo was the biggest town in Sicily. Were you with Patton there? Patton was there, yeah. I saw Patton two or three times. Also Bob Hope and so his troop came from America to entertain us there. See, that only lasted about a month. Sicily lasted about a month. Tell over. me more about Sicily. What did you do in, the, in that Sicilian campaign? I was in ammunition again. And the engineers really are supposed to handle the ammunition per se. We're not supposed to handle it because we're specialists. But I don't know where they was at any shop, so the old man said, you guys got to help establish a dump. And so we did. We had Italian trucks and we established a dump and our drill and the infantry would come back and get that. And there was some pretty heavy fighting around. They had those Tiger, German Tiger tanks. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys got killed in the infantry that we knew real well. Man, that's when it really hit. I mean, when I hit Sicily, I saw the first dead man. We're going up a little old incline, and the guy was right in front of me. And that guy fell over, and a bullet hit him right here and just did it down. He never even moved. And they had taught us, don't ever stop. You just keep on going. Let the medics take care of those guys, you know. Uh, we had a few bad moments, but not too much. They had a few air raids, and you remember some... American par paratroopers went in and we all thought they were Germans. And they shot a lot of American paratroopers because we didn't know what they were. Where was this? In Sicily. Was this that we first landed or what? Yeah, about day one or two or three or four. Yeah. Uh, and they don't hear much about that, but that really happened. And they always teach you to dig a foxhole. <laughs> and I said, shit, I'm not dig a foxhole. I'm tired. And this ground just like this was hot. Hard. There's nothing but olive trees there, you know. Mm -hmm. And those olive trees are a little bit old. Just like a pine, you know, a pin oak. You know how tough those things are? Oh. Blackjacks, you can't hardly cut them with us. So I had to just bounce off. Well, they were just like that. And I, I'm too tired. I'm going to sleep on this old olive tree. And I did about midnight. Here come those third troopers. And you could see them. But they were Americans. But we didn't know that. And boy, I thought, boy, if I live through this, I'm never going <laughs> to go to bed without well, a slit chance or a fox or something. They teach me. Wow, some of scary, but they began to land close by, but they bring them in, and they were Americans. How many of them were killed? Oh, a lot of them were killed. Because well, they didn't know what they were. And it's crazy. You know, if you're not used to combat, and uh, you get a little trigger hacker, you can shoot them. But we had his old Thompson machine guns. That's what they gave us, was Thompson machine guns. We trained with those old three rifles, but we never used them. <coughs> and they kept a lot of German stuff and Italian stuff. Mm -hmm. And we lasted pretty quick. I remember one time we was going across the country. And we got strafed and uh, our truck got on fire. I lost everything I had. I mean, just lost everything. I mean, I had nothing except clothes I had on. <clears throat> and they issued us all this stuff. Of course, uh, we lost your address books and uh, all those kind of things, the personal items. Were you there at Palermo when Patton and Montgomery met? I don't remember those two, but I remember Patton riding up and down that old shiny helmet and those lugers on those guns on both sides, and he had a driver. At that time, they had a different kind of a car than they had. They don't have them now. Big Staff man car? They were, didn't have any top on them. Yeah. And uh, something like this. The driver up here and then the place in the back, but no top on it. Yeah. I don't know if they had those or not. <coughs> he used to ride in the back seat and the driver would 
take him uh, places. After Sicily, where'd you go? We went to uh, Italy. I went to Salerno and I to go run off that place. Tell me about Salerno. Yeah. What? How bad was Salerno? It was bad. I'm telling you, those, they were using those 105s point blank. Use them like you do rifles. And they got the hot, they put blankets on them, pour water on them. Well, the Germans were right up there on those. You see, Italy, the middle of Italy is just, I don't want to call them mountains, but they sure look like it. Mm -hmm. And they were there waiting, you see. <laughs> and man, they didn't know if we were going to stay there or not, but those GIs were pretty dogged in there. They finally made it. How did you win the Battle of Salerno? Sure. How did the Americans win that battle there at Salerno? What saved them was the airplanes. They got those big old bombers in, and they what they call saturation bombing, and patterned it. And each bomber knew exactly where he was supposed to drop his bomb. And he came over, he could hear those things coming. They were hearing more. A lot of big old bombers, four, four motor bombers. And they just saturated that place, and they gave America enough breathing space to operate. If they hadn't been for that, I don't think we ever made it. Mm -hmm.